Brethren, we come back to the Sermon on the Mount, and uh, we come to chapter 7 again. I'd like to kindly request that you turn to Matthew chapter 7, going to read in your hearing verse 7 to 11, and then I'll preach a second part of this sermon, Grace Enabled Asking, Seeking, Knocking. This is God's word. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks, receives. And the one who seeks, finds. And to the one who knocks, it will be opened. For which one of you, if his son asks him for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for fish, will give him a serpent? If then, if you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father, who is in heaven, give good things to those who ask him? That is God's word. May it please him to bless us as we think about it, as we hear uh, his word preached from it. Last time as we gathered together, I showed you this beautiful command to embrace the means for a grace-energized life. You want to live a grace-energized life? Scriptures were clear. Command was given. Today, having given you, shown you the command, I will spend time calling you to see the grace that makes prayer possible, the grace that makes this means of grace called prayer possible. I would like to enlarge upon the grace behind prayer. And I would want you to see God, his love, his mercy, his kindness in designing prayer, in making it possible for you to pray. But for recapping, Last time, we thought about the promise here, ask and you will receive, seek and you will find, knock and the door shall be opened. And we say this promise comes within the context. What is the context? We are in the Sermon on the Mount. This is a sermon. One of the mistakes we saw last time that people make with the Sermon on the Mount is cherry picking. You just disregard the fact that a sermon has been going on and you come to a section and cherry pick. And so this particular section, for example, is one that is heavily abused by many who would call themselves friends of Matthew 7, verse 7 to 11, because they disregard the context. Ask, seek, and knock have been given within a context. What was the context? The demands on the Sermon on the Mount have been brought forth clearly so far to us. Chapter 5, chapter 6, and chapter 7, verse 1 to 6. And those demands are very uncompromising. The demands are high. Before this one positive command, ask, seek, knock, we have had 14 negative commands saying do not, do not, do not. And now we have, for the first time, a positive call, ask, seek, knock. So the self-aware listener, if he has been, if she has been alert during the Sermon on the Mount as the Lord was preaching to his first audience, 
That person is aware he cannot fulfill the demands. I cannot fulfill these demands. The Lord forbids anger in the Sermon on the Mount. The Lord forbids lust. He commands that we keep every word. Let your yes be yes and your no be no. He expects that you give freely to those who borrow. He prohibits you from worry. He prohibits you from boasting. He expects you, dear saint, to let your light so shine before men that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. Matthew 5.16. In fact, in Matthew 5.48, in summary, this is what he expects of you. Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. The breadth and depth of these standards are beyond us. They would lead you and they would lead me if I am concentrating and if I'm understanding what's going on to despair. But the Lord intervenes and the Lord brings us encouragement. He explains how the discipline Rather, he explains to you how, as a disciple, you may reach this high standard of holiness. He tells you, do not be dismayed. Do not be dismayed because of what I'm commanding you to do, what I'm demanding from you. Why? Because it is by prayer that I will help you to reach the high standard set forth in the Sermon on the Mount. And that's the context. The promise has a context. He is speaking to a particular people. Who are the recipients of the promise? Ask, and you will receive. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened. It is those in verse 11 who call God. Father. Those are the people. Those are the people who are being told, ask. And you will receive, seek, and you will find, knock, and the door will be opened. This section of Matthew, just like the section between chapter 25, chapter 6, verse 25 to 34, which we have already looked at, which told us, do not be anxious because your heavenly father knows your needs. He takes care of the, the birds of the air, the grass of the field. This section, just like that section in Matthew chapter 6, is intended to encourage you, to support you as a disciple when you are hesitant, when you are despairing, because of being dismayed at the great weight of the commandments that Jesus Christ has put forth. And these commandments are serious. They are not optional extras. He has said in Matthew 5, is it 19 and 20, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will not enter heaven. You cannot enter heaven. So this is not just about extra bonga points and being index one in the church. This is a life and death issue. And anyone who realizes that without this, you cannot enter heaven, would be tempted to throw up their hand and just say, Lord, this is too much. Who can do this? So the disciple here is being encouraged to ask. And today I'm going to show you that the disciple is not just being encouraged to ask. Bigger than that, greater than that, much more than that, the disciple is being invited to see the heart of God, the inclination of God, the reassurance that comes to you from that, that God intends to strengthen you, to bless you, he knows you're weak, and he is willing to strengthen, encourage, support you, and enable you to ascend to that place of righteousness, 
that is that of the scribes and the Pharisees, that place of being perfect, even as he is perfect. And in his wisdom, he has instituted prayer as a tool that he will use to strengthen this prayer. In the minds of many, it is too simple a thing. Perhaps they see it as simplistic. Others see it as too difficult. And, and because of holding on to those two extremes, many, even within the church, slide into prayerlessness. And as a result, they fail to experience the blessings of fellowship with God. The Lord teaches us about prayer here. And he teaches through prayer using repeated commands. He just employs hammer blows of repetition here. Repeated commands, repeated universal statements, and a parable to illustrate in order to communicate to you and to me some very important things about prayer as a means of grace for anyone who is going to live a grace-energized life. We saw last time that these promises come in the form of a command or commands. Ask is a command. Seek is a command. Knock is a command. And we said the Lord could have basically put out the information, the, this, this as an information. He, he could have just said, by the way, if you ever need to ask, just know uh, you can ask. He could have put it out as an entreaty or as information to you. But he does more than that as a way of expressing his love and mercy strongly to you. It's like the parent telling the child, and ensure you eat your food when you are hungry. And the child then eats when they are hungry. The child knows that if I am hungry, because there was a command, I can go to mommy. Mommy said, come to me, ensure you come to me as soon as you are hungry. And the Lord is not just saying, by the way, I answer prayers, in case you ever think of asking. He is telling you, I command you to ask, and I command you to seek, and I command you to knock. And as I said last time, you do not see this in the English translations, but the ask, seek, and knock are in the present continuous form. It is not just ask once, it is ask and keep asking, seek and keep seeking, knock and keep knocking. It's as if on one hand I would have told you stop at the red lights. And then on the other hand, like here in this text, I am telling you always stop at the red lights. So the call is to continuously do this. The commands also do remind us that this is a privilege but it's also a duty. Prayerlessness is a privilege and it's a duty. The, the form of the command makes it that way. And if you've been a Christian for any lengthy period of time, you know that many privileges are at times very difficult. Many spiritual privileges are at times very difficult to appropriate. We are just lazy and we are weak or wicked. And so I want it to be known to you that you need to remember that because this high privilege of prayer is given to you as a command, to fail to do it is not just to opt out of God's blessing. To fail to do it is to disobey God, is to tell him, I refuse to obey you. And so when you're tempted to think, I don't feel like praying. Pray as one who is obeying the command. Feelings will come along. They will follow. When you feel like I'm, I'm not joining the prayer meeting and all I'll do is just watch news. After all, I want to know what's happening in the political space. I won't join the prayer meeting. Please remember you are disobeying a command. You are not just 
forfeiting positive blessings that would come your way, you are bringing upon yourself what should be brought upon those who bring displeasure to God. And we also did see that the, the, the command being in a continuous form reminds us that God is always available to meet our needs and we always need it. We always have a need, but God is always ready to meet that need. And finally, the crescendo, the increase in the nature of the command. You don't just ask, you seek. You don't just seek, you knock. When you ask, it's more verbal. When you seek, then it's something precious that is lost and you're turning every stone to find it. You so desire this thing. When you knock, you so desire this thing that you're willing to deal with obstacles, the things that are in between you and your desired goals. God is saying that he will grant you breakthroughs. He will grant breakthroughs to you if you are desperate and you are determined for these blessings. Now today then, having taken those 10 minutes to recap, today then, let us look at the third point from this section. And I invite you to see how the promise, the promise here, the promises here, display, parade, illustrate, show forth the contents of grace. See how the promises in this section exhibit the grace of God. See how the promises in this section are going to parade and display the grace of God. We are talking here about asking, seeking, and knocking, which is grace-enabled. This is grace-enabled asking, seeking, and knocking that makes a grace-energized life possible. And it is my hope that you will truly be amazed at the grace of God. He has graciously granted us this means of grace called prayer. Now this promise exhibits, as I see, three privileges. The first privilege is the privilege of God's presence. And the Lord is saying you have assurance of access. You have assurance of access. And that is a mercy. That is a grace from God. When he says for everyone who asks, receives. And the one who seeks, finds. And the one who knocks, it will be open to him. You need to see a mercy there. Deep grace from the Lord. Because remember in verse 11, as part of giving the illustration, asking who amongst you will give a stone as a father to his child when the child is asking for bread or a snake, and Luke 12 would call it a scorpion, if your child asks for fish or an egg. And then it's a... It's a it's a rhetorical question. None of us would do that. Generally, parents would seek the very best for their children. And then the Lord says, if you guys who are evil, he, he knows we are evil. If you then who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your father who is in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? The Lord is saying, you have the privilege of access. He is saying, God is your heavenly father. And at the same time, he is saying, you are evil. How do you reconcile those things? On one hand, you will have safe dealings with God, the thrice holy God. The God who is so holy that the angels who have never sinned cannot 
afford to look at him. They have never sinned. They do not need mediation for the sake of dealing with their sins, but they can't just show up into his presence. They cover their faces, their feet, and they sing holy, holy, holy as they fly around. That God who is thrice holy, whose scripture tells us cannot behold sin, on the other hand, is dealing safely with us. He, he is listening to us. We have been graciously given a share in the sonship of the Lord Jesus Christ. So that just as the Lord would be able to refer to God as Abba, Father, we too are granted the privilege of being able to refer to God as Abba, Father. We who are sinners, notice the Lord did not say, if we then who are evil, the Lord identifies with us in our weaknesses, but not in our sinfulness. The Lord makes it very clear, and I say that as an applicatory aside, it is very clear that he is the Lamb of God, spotless. He takes away the sins of the world. He doesn't say, if we then who are evil. He says, if you who are evil know how to give good gifts. Christ has permission to call God Abba, Father. And he gives us that privilege. He gives us the privilege of calling God Father. How can this be? The Lord Jesus Christ makes this possible. It reminds me of Thomas Binney's song, Eternal Light, Eternal Light. How pure a soul must be. And in two of the stanzas, Thomas Binney, that hymn, Eternal Light, Eternal Light, asks, Oh, how shall I, whose native sphere is dark, whose mind is deep before the ineffable appear and on my naked spirit bear the uncreated beam. Then he says there is a way for man to rise to that sublime abode and offering and a sacrifice our Holy Spirit's energies and advocate with God. This is amazing grace. And we ought to be amazed at it. That we have been adopted into the family of God through Jesus Christ. And we have been given the power to be called the sons of God. As he has been granted to all who have received the Lord Jesus Christ. John, the Apostle John in 1 John chapter 3 is still amazed at this privilege. In 1 John chapter 3, verse 1, he says, Behold what kind of love, what manner of love the Father has given to us, that we should be called children of God. Then he adds, and so we are. It's not, it's not just a name. This is not just adoption into the family where you are included legally into the membership of that family, but your DNA doesn't become the DNA of your adopting father and your adopting mother. This is different. He says, behold, what kind of manner of love is this? The father has called us his children. And we are indeed made his children. And he says in verse 2 of 1 John chapter 3, and we are his children right now. He says, beloved, we are God's children now. 
we are not just disciples, students, followers, but we are also children. We therefore come to God in prayer as those who have an intimate relationship and an obedient inclination towards him. And both these are a work of grace. That you have a desire to obey him is a work of grace. That you can have an intimate relationship with God and call him Father is a work of grace. Grace makes possible this means of grace called prayer. And we bow down with thanksgiving before the Lord. And this gets better. Look at the words, everyone. Everyone, not just pastors. As some out there would like you to think who turn pastors into people who are no different from witch doctors. The pastor is not a witch doctor. We have, yes, gifts. We have authority. We have a calling, and we are not embarrassed about that. But we, like you, are men of like passions. Elijah was a man just like us, but he prayed. And the Lord tells us the effectual fervent prayer of the righteous avails much. Everyone, the one who seeks, the one who knocks has access. Everyone, the privilege of assured access to God is for all his children. And this is a beautiful parading, a beautiful exhibition of grace. The young and the old, the rich and the poor, the educated or the illiterate, men and women, boys and girls, vocational ministers and those who are not pastors, whichever categories we can see in the church right now, we have the privilege of access to God in prayer. And Calvin says, nothing is better adapted to excite us to prayer than that full conviction that we will be had. And First John chapter 5, tells us in verse 14, and this is the confidence that we have to add him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. You're not just speaking into empty space. You have audience, audience with the God who hung the galaxies like chandeliers. The God who is so mighty and so high that he has to stoop down to see heaven. He has time for you. Some of you work in companies where you've never even seen your CEO face to face. You see him in the newspaper and on TV and he's in Nairobi with you. It's not like you're working for some international conglomerate that is so far, your CEO is here. But you, you just would never have audience with him. How? You, what would you be thinking to try and have audience with him? He's too busy for you, and you're too small for him. And the God of the universe says you have access 24-7-365. Because of God's grace revealed in the person and the work of Jesus Christ, you have the privilege of access to God. This command, this call to pray is a display of God's grace to you. Grace makes prayer possible. How will you respond to this precious gift? This precious gift of access, direct access, no operator. 
No gatekeepers. Hopefully not by neglecting it. Hopefully not by trivializing it. Hopefully not by misusing it, abusing it. Some of us think more clearly about what we will say to our girlfriends than we think about what we will say to God. You, you, you have your lines better than when you are before God. You are before God and you are everywhere. I mean, you just, you hear people praying and I find myself sadly praying at times and I'm just thinking, this is wrong. This is unacceptable. And when we gather together for our prayer meetings, do we pray as those who recognize that I have the privilege of access, the language I am using, the proper use of the microphone so that others can hear? Do we misuse or do we abuse this privilege? Have we taken it lightly? Are we yawning? As we sing Amazing Grace, we are no longer amazed by this. Let us steward this privilege by using it, using it well, using it to the max. Our frame of mind must be humble because who am I to be in the presence of God? Yet my frame of mind should also be thankfulness. I must behave appropriately in the presence of God. And so I plead with you, dear saint, don't, don't lose sight of this privilege. This privilege which you have in Christ when it comes to prayer. Right now realize this, you have the privilege of access to God. And you have the privilege, when you access God, of having safe dealings with him. The thrice holy God, even though you are evil. A mind-boggling privilege. A sinner saved by grace because of faith in Jesus Christ has this privilege. All of us have it. Don't miss prayer meetings. Don't miss times of communion with God. Pray, pray, dear saint. Ask, seek, knock. Ask, seek, knock. Secondly, the privilege of God's provision. And here you are not just assured of access. You are assured of answers. You are assured of answers. Everyone who asks, receives. And the one who seeks, finds. And the one who knocks, it will be opened. In the illustration given in this section, the Lord says, fathers as a rule do not mock their children when their children are in need. And he also says, fathers as a rule will generally not give their needy children things that would harm them. So when you're praying and you're in need, God is not in heaven, heaven laughing at you and thinking about how he's going to give you a stone that looks like bread, and you will not realize it until you break your teeth on it. God is not going to mock you, he says. He says, how much more if our fathers do good to us even though they are evil? How much more, he says. The, the, the reason for the illustration is not a comparison. It is to contrast. It is to tell you, remember how you trust in daddy? If you've had the privilege of having the kind of father who, though evil, still cares for you, how much more? God. He will not give you a stone, a useless item, 
or a snake, a cruel thing in response to your prayers. When you need necessities, bread, fish, these are staples, these are necessities for life. And remember the context, we are dealing with the Sermon on the Mount, and you've gotten to a place where you're saying, oh Lord, nobody can do this. I'm not poor in spirit. I do not hunger and thirst for righteousness. I'm not pure in heart. I'm not merciful. I'm not a peacemaker. I do not rejoice in the midst of persecution. Have mercy on me. In the midst of that, he says, ask and be assured of this. You will receive. You will receive these things. Our labor in prayer is not in vain. Because where God finds your praying heart, you will find a prayer hearing God. Wherever God finds a praying heart from one of his children, he will be found as a prayer hearing God, and he shall give you an answer. And the precept is thrice. The command is given thrice. Ask, seek, knock. But the promise is given six times. So as he gives the command, he is telling you, Ask, and you will receive. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and the door will be open. And then he repeats the promise again. Everyone who asks, know this, will receive. He repeats the promise more times than he repeats even the command. Twice. And then he gives you this assurance in a language that is present in its tense. And this is more than a promise concerning the future. It is not just that everyone who asks will receive sometime in the future. It's a present tense, receives, finds, and it will be open. He gives it to you as a present possession in the now. The realization may take time, but he hears and he answers. Dear brother, dear sister, wait on the Lord. He heard you and he answered you. And you may not have seen the answer right now, but in his time he will make all things beautiful. Our God is much better than our earthly fathers. He is wiser. He is richer. And he is not evil. Let us remember. Let us remember this promise. The promise of answer to our prayers. Jesus wants to assure us that God hears us and God will give us what is good. And so the, the lesson here, remember, is encouragement. He's telling you, remember the father-son relationship? I assure you, I will do much better. We can't be compared. He is not just willing to give good gifts to you. He is able to give those good gifts to you. All the necessities that you require for a spiritual life, you will receive.
and receiving again stresses, grace, because you are passive. The stress here is on someone else will give you a gift. Somebody else will grant you a discovery. Somebody else will welcome you and grant you hospitality. You are a passive recipient of the gift, of the discovery, and of the hospitality. It is all grace. It is all grace, dear friends. We have assurance of prayer, of, of our prayers being heard and God answering our prayers that seek our good, seek his glory. God is good. And he only does good. There are some who say prayer is unseemly. It's, it's out of place because how do, you, how do you pray to a God who knows everything? He's already told you that even before you ask, he knows. And then some would say prayer is not just unseemly, but prayer is unnecessary. And they would say prayer is unnecessary because there are many who don't pray. They still receive. You know of many who don't pray for their daily food, they just work. And when they get the food, they don't even give thanks. They just eat. So why should we pray? Why should we pray in, in, in a situation where it seems unnecessary? I think it needs to be said to such people that there is a distinction between the gifts of God as creator of all men and the gifts of God as our heavenly father. We need to distinguish between creation gifts on the one hand and redemption gifts on the other. It is true that God gives creation gifts, the harvests from the fields, a salary in their account, babies to a couple. to all, whether they believe in him or not. The scriptures say God gives to all men life and breath and all things. He makes his son to rise upon the evil and the just. He makes his rain to come upon the just and the unjust. But when we turn to redemption gifts, the situation is very different. Or does God bestow salvation upon all men alike, whether they pray for it or not? Whether they believe in Christ or not? The contrary, Scripture does teach us that he is rich towards them who call upon him. He who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And the good things spoken of in verse 11, which we will look at in the final point, as I said last time, touches on the context here. It is not our material necessities, but the spiritual blessings that in the parallel passage in Luke chapter in Luke's gospel, are described as the Holy Spirit. There, Luke would say, if you are earthly fathers, do this good to you. How much more will your heavenly father give you the Holy Spirit? How much more will he give the Holy Spirit to those who ask? 
thinking of the Holy Spirit here calls us to think of the comprehensive gift, the one who, who encompasses other spiritual blessings. We are talking about forgiveness. We are talking about holiness. We are talking about peace of mind. We are talking about a good conscience, a good heart, the increase of hope and love. And for such things, we must pray. Does this mean that we have to have such a distinguishing separation between creation gifts and redemption gifts? No. Because the disciples prayer, or as it is commonly called, the Lord's prayer, brings this together. In the disciples prayer, you pray, give me this day my daily bread, give us this day our daily bread. But you also pray, forgive us our debts, which is a redemption gift. You also pray, lead us not into temptation, which is a redemption gift. So we pray for our daily bread as Christians, not because only those who pray for it will receive it, but for us we acknowledge that God, as the creator and the provider, is the one whom we look up to with regards to our necessities. Then we pray for forgiveness and deliverance from evil for another reason, namely that we will not get them unless we pray for them. So we are acknowledging that God, you are the one who gives me the power to become rich as we pray for creation gifts. But on the other hand, we are also recognizing unless you forgive me and unless you deliver me from evil, I will not get it from anywhere. Finally, the privilege of God's protection. You have assurance of wise denials when you pray amiss. You have the assurance that if you pray amiss, your heavenly Father is wise and loving to deny your requests. Because we are told in verse 11 that what he is going to give us is this thing described as good things. Our heavenly Father will not give us poison simply because we are asking for it. There are those who, because of God's wise denials, have decided prayer is unproductive. So there are those who say prayer is unseemly. You can't just walk into God's presence and begin talking. After all, he is all wise, and it's just uncouth of you to imagine yourself bringing information to God. And then there are those who would say prayer is unnecessary because we've seen around people who don't pray and they are blessed. And then there are those who say prayer is unproductive. I prayed, prayed to pass exams. I failed. I prayed to get married. I'm still single. I prayed to get a job. I still haven't seen that job. Therefore, prayer is unproductive. The promises of the Lord Jesus Christ on the psalm, on the mount, are not unconditioned. Think about it momentarily and you'll see what I am saying. Ask and you will receive is not to be treated as a universal magic formula. It's not a habracadabra. If asking meant that we would receive everything we would pray for, then praying would turn me and you into magicians, and it would turn God into our servant, who exists to do our bidding. And worse, it would put intolerable strain on you 
if you are a sensitive Christian, if you knew that God was bound to give you everything you ask for in prayer, you would be a very stressed person. Alec Motier said, if it were the case that whatever we ask God was, God was pledged to give, then I for one would never pray again because I would not have sufficient confidence in my own wisdom to ask God for anything. It would impose an intolerable burden on frail human wisdom if, by his prayer promises, God was pledged to give whatever we ask, whenever we ask, and in exactly the terms we ask. How could we bear such a burden? And this is grace once more. Can you imagine if your words were like the word of faith movement want your words to be? If you decreed, and it would always be so, do you imagine the terrible situation you would be in? It's frightening. But we thank God that's not the case. God looks at our prayer, and what is for our spiritual good, he will give us. But if we ask him for stones, a place of bread, if we ask him for snakes instead of fish, whereas evil fathers may grant the wishes of their sinful children, our God is not in the business of spoiling us. He will not grant us things that will harm us. And at times the things are bad, at times the things are good, but it's not the proper time. And at times the things are good in themselves, but they are not good for us. And he says no. And that is a blessing. That is a mercy from God. We thank him for this grace. Martin Lloyd-Jones, in his Sermon on the Mount, in this particular section, said, I thank God that he is not prepared to do anything that I may chance to ask him. And I say that as a result, and I say that as a result of my own past experience. In my past life, I, like all others, I've often asked God for things and have asked God to do things which at the time I wanted very much and which I believed were the very best things for me. But now standing at this particular juncture in my life and looking back, I say that I am profoundly grateful to God that he did not grant me certain things for which I asked and that he shut certain doors in my face. At the time I did not understand, but I know now, and I'm grateful to God for it. So I thank God that it is not a universal promise, and that God is not going to grant me my every desire and request. God has a much better way for us. And so this is another aspect of grace in prayer. He grants us access. He grants us answers. But he also takes care of us when we ask amiss. Oh, we thank God. And we pray that he would help us to know what is good and to ask for what is good. As I conclude, Hopefully you see that prayer is important. And prayer is a privilege, a costly privilege. It has taken the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ for you to be able to approach the throne of grace boldly. So if you're not praying, there is possibly... Three things that are lacking if you are a Christian. 
One is knowledge. Do you know the will of God? Do you know the scriptures? Because if there is no prayer, perhaps as a child of God, the lacking thing is you have no knowledge. You don't know God. You don't know his will. And therefore, you don't know what to ask. Or maybe, secondly, the prayerlessness is a sign that there is no faith. You know what God wants, but you somewhat live like the fool of Psalm 14. The fool says in his heart there is no God. You don't have faith in the fact that God and God alone can bring this thing that in his word he expects you to have. Or maybe, thirdly, you don't desire it. And we need to check ourselves. Why is my praying weak? Is it a lack of knowledge? Is it a lack of faith? A lack of trusting in God? Or is it a lack of desire, delighting in the things that delight God and being saddened by the things that annoy God? May the Lord help us. Let us remember, ask and you will receive. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be open. Let us ask. Let us continuously ask. Let us continuously seek. Let us continuously know.